Okay, this lecture will go over trim and details in ready-to-wear apparel. The main two people that are involved in trim decisions are the designers and product developers. Um, they use trim and embellishments to add details and interest to the surface of apparel products. Oops, sorry about the typo there. Um, Trims are classified as decorative materials or surface treatments that embellish a garment and add distinctiveness to a style. The, um, there are some companies also have trim sourcers or trim designers, and their entire job is solely devoted to um, designing trim for a garment, and they'll work with the designers to do that. Um, aesthetic or decorative details will enhance the overall garment appearance. And some of the main ones that we'll go over, the main categories are linear trims, narrow fabric trims, surface embellishments, and decorative details. Starting with linear trims, the main, oops, we're still good. Uh, sorry about that. The main types of linear trims are usually on the edges or seams of garments. And these are decorative edgings and seams, top stitching and edge stitching, hem stitching. Some decorative edging and seam details. Um, we've seen a few of these. We, I know that we've we've already gone over lettuce edging, which is just a decorative type of edge finish. Um, double stitching on welt seams is a type of seam um, decoration. And then also this one, this picture on the far right here, slot seams. It's just a way to add detail um, in between a seam line. Top stitching is very commonly used and it is um, visible stitching on the fashion side of a garment um, just to add some more visual interest or really emphasize the seam lines. This example here has got um, piping and um, several rows of top stitching. Something to think about, a um, couple jean companies that are very well known for their top stitching details. Hem stitching is when you take um, a couple strands of parallel threads, I mean yarns, you take them completely out of uh, the um, weave and then you take the weft yarns and wrap little strings around them to create a sort of decorative ladder. And you look at this picture here on the right. So these rows going up and down have been removed and then you can see in the red that these um, horizontal ones have been wrapped around to create that ladder effect. Fagging um, is made by connecting two separate edges um, together with an interwoven um, sort of crisscross braid pattern. So in this example here, this is the shell piece and then this is the decorative piece. And this in between is the fagging technique where you use um, you know, you can use different color threads, um, but it's mainly this crisscross kind of pattern that's used to connect um, two edges. Here again, in the middle of these two is that technique, and then here are a couple of variations of the fagging technique. Piping and cording, I know we've already gone over this, but it is commonly used a lot in ready-to-wear apparel to um, add interest or detail. Here it is around the pocket, on this baseball cap to show this emphasize the seam lines and then here's cording around the edge of a seat cushion or something um, next is the narrow fabric trims and these consist of ribbon passementry lace and within lace we'll go over the levers machine the rochelle knit machines and the shifley embroidery machines Ribbon is used quite a bit in ready-to-wear apparel. Um, there are several different types of, ri of ribbon. I'm sorry about that. Um, here is a satin ribbon. There is a gross grain ribbon, and this has got the rib kind of texture in it. Here's the velvet ribbon. Pico edge ribbon. I know we've all seen these. And then this is roshin ribbon or ribbon that is pre-gathered. Um, these type of trims are really popular in children's apparel and used in lots of different detailing. 
Um, passementry is a French word. This is the hooked on phonics pronunciation. Pass men tree spelled as, as such here. Um, and this is really a broad term that describes um, braids with either ribbon or cords. Um, they can be in straight, curved, fringed, or tassel forms. And the main types of passementry that I'll go over is a midi braid, a gimp braid, um, a rick rack and a fold over braid. And these are all, I'm sure you've all seen these before in uh, ready to wear. Um, so here is a, just a broad, these are all the different types of passementry. This type of braiding here, this is like the fishtail braid that was really popular in hairstyles. Um, and here is um, another one that we'll go over in just a second. Heavier than the midi braids. Sorry about that. The gimp braid is more decorative and heavier than the midi braid. That should say midi braid here. Um, and it's usually made of cord. The one thing that's really distinctive about the gimp braid is that it has the V with the curls on the end um, all going in the same direction. And one way that helps me remember that the gimp braid has the V is because it's heavier um, than the midi. And um, I don't know. That's just how I remember it. Rick rack. I'm sure we've all seen this before. It is a woven zigzag trim that can come in several widths and several different colors. The main thing about Rick rack is that it's really playful and um, I don't know, kind of, I don't know if young looking is the right term, but really shows, uh, just makes clothing look youthful and it's usually in a lot of bright colors. Like you wouldn't see this on uh, in couture apparel or like on the red carpet. The fold over braid can be um, knit or woven trim that has a, a permanent built in crease that is used um, as binding to finish an edge. So here on this dress you can see it finishes the neckline and the armhole and this is what it's like when it's pressed open. There's this crease right in here and um, here's what it's like when it is closed. So the fold over braid is a trim that is used as an edge finish um, to make a bound seam. Other types of narrow trim, um, fringe, and this is where you have a tape or braid that has threads or cords or maybe even beads um, hanging free. And the purpose of fringe is to elongate a hemline, to decorate horizontal seams, or emphasize movement when a garment is worn. And in this picture here, they're doing all three. So across the top of the bust, they're um, decorating that horizontal seam um, they've got it around the bottom to elongate the hemline and then there's really a lot of movement um, when this garment you can tell when this woman's walking. Um, another type of narrow trim is cording that is braided into tassels. You see tassels in um, in your what's it called interior products like um, curtains or pillows details like that and then sometimes in costume clothing or you see this is a lot on um, purses too purses luggage um, that kind of stuff lace um, is not really in the category of a woven or knit it's basically a trim it's called fabric can be called fabric that's made into intricate designs and lace can vary in it can be light and airy lots of open um, open work or it can be really heavy and really textured. The main three that we'll go over is the levers machine, um, the Rochelle knit, and the Shifley embroidery. Um, the levers machines produce a beautiful high cost lace that involves complex design and open work. You can tell the edges here are all scalloped. There's um, variations in texture and weight. Um, all over the, the pattern here. Um, so the levers machines produce a really high quality lace. And if you want to watch a video on it, here's a link. Um, you can go see how it's produced. The Rochelle knit machines produce a lower cost knit lace that um, comes in a variety of weights and textures. Um, and one sort of key identifier um, of price is you'll know that um, Rochelle knit laces are, are 
quite a bit cheaper. Um, the Shifley embroidery machines produce two types of lace, eyelet lace and Venetian lace. And these really vary across the board in cost and quality. Um, you can have a very, very low cost eyelet um, and a fairly inexpensive Venetian lace. But then on the other hand, you can also have a very expensive eyelet and a very expensive Venetian lace. Um, so it depends on you know who your target market is, how much money you've got, um, and what the end use of the product is going to be. Surface embellishments. Now when you add a surface embellishment, embellishment, the only purpose is to add decorative appeal. And these are the main, the main key ones that I wanna hit on. I've got a couple other in there, but um, appliques, embroidery, screen printing, sequins and beading. And I know there was a little bit con of confusion between appliques and embroidery. So let's go over that. Um, an applique is a is additional decorative fabric or patches that are applied directly onto the item. They can be applied with stitching. They can be applied with heat. Um, this elephant over here is most likely applied with heat because you can't really see any um, major stitches around the edge. So you can make a safe assumption that this is a patch that's been ironed on, ironed on. But with the WVU shirt here, you can see that there's some stitch lines. So maybe this was applied with um, a zigzag. The main difference between that and the embroidery is that the embroidery is stitches right onto the fabric. Um, and the stitches create the design or the pattern. So here's the an example of like some J. Crew capris that have embroidery stitches that form the design right on the pants. Another way to embellish with surface design is um, using fabric on the bias. And I know we've seen this example before. You just turn the fabric at a 45 degree angle and then um, whatever pattern in the fabric, obviously you would use uh, a printed or something with stripes to really um, emphasize the bias detail. Um, but here's a, an example of the bias on the pocket and then the bias on the yoke. One thing that you want to be really careful of is when you're using a printed um, striped fabric is that they match up when you're putting them to your pattern. So imagine if this white stripe wasn't matched up just right. It might be a little bit lower on this side and then all the stripes on the right side would be a little bit lower than on the left and that would not, uh, you would just assume the quality of the garment isn't very high because the, you know whoever was constructing it couldn't even match up the um, whatever fabric lines. Another example um, in sleeves is just another place where you wanna be sure that you're matching up. Sequins and beading are also important. Um, like we talked about, um, well, more like buttons. I was thinking, but um, buttons can be used to surface embellish and they can come in tons of different sizes and shapes and colors. It's like this girl in the white dress is probably, looks like she's got a bunch of wood beads. Um, and then this girl over here has got lots of sequins to create the design. Foiling is another surface embellishment that is used. Um, and it's when you apply thin strips of synthetic film that attach to the fabric with a heat press. And so here's a really open foiling design technique. These ones are quite a bit closer and a little more intricate, but um, when you do this process, it gives that uh, sort of illuminating um, factor. And you see this a lot in um, dance apparel, um, ice skating apparel, costuming, because um, it really helps it stand out on stage. Rhinestone application. Um, rhinestones can be made of glass, plastic, um, or crystal, and they come in a variety of sizes and colors, and they produce a shimmery, sparkly effect. Screen printing is when um, pigment is applied to screens that have designs in them, and then pressure is used to transfer transfer the pigment 
to the shirt. So in this first step here with the yellow, looks like they are screen printing some sort of design onto a green shirt. And this is what it looks like when you screen print and then lift the screen up. And this last example here would be um, the completed project. Now, one thing to remember about is that every color has a different screen. So this shirt over here probably had, I don't know, 10 or 12 different screens on it to get all the different colors. Um, Trapunto, it comes from the Italian word embroider, and it's a technique for quilting, um, also called stuff technique. And this is where you put um, padding into very specific pieces. So you need at least two layers. Um, and it produces a raised surface in specific areas, not just on quilts, but in purses and jackets and um, lots of other places. I'll show some examples here. So you can see that there's a variety of shapes and styles that you can do um, when using a trapunto embellishment um, on this quilt. It's only specific areas that have the padding pressed into it. And um, here it is on the purse and it's most commonly used in quilts, but it has started to make a comeback in fashion. I think um, Vera Bradley does a little bit of this. She does more just um, decorative stitching, but I've seen this in some of her pieces. Okay, we are going to review a little bit of decorative fabric details. And this is where you manipulate the fashion fabric to get detail. The ones that we will go over again are tucks, pleats, ruffles, flounce, shearing, and smocking. Okay, a tuck is a fold of fabric that is sewn together. And the main thing about tucks is that they are uniform in width and they go, um, I guess they can go horizontal and vertical, but you mostly see them going horizontal. I mean vertical, like in the tuxedo shirt right here, vertical up and down. Pleat, um, a fold of fabric at the edge of a garment. Typically, you will see it at the waistline edge. And remember, there are quite a few variations of pleats. You have your knife pleat your kick pleats, um, accordion pleats, sunburst pleats. So be sure to review those so you can easily um, identify the differences. Ruffle is um, a series of gatherings or uh, inconsistent pleating strips of fabric. And these are just strips, um, rectangular pieces of fabric that are gathered together to make this and here is she's got the ruffling detail around the neckline and around the arm so flounce which is similar to a ruffle but the flounce is made from a circular pattern rather than the straight strips so obviously it's more expensive than a ruffle because it uses more fabric um, and these are examples of flounce and the main way to tell the difference is that a ruffle is going to have gathering along the seam line. So this is obviously a ruffle because you can see the gathering around here and all the way around here on this seam line. But when you go to a flounce, you have the same effect on the bottom edge, but the seam line where it connects, there is no gathering. There are no creases. That is the main distinguisher between a ruffle and a flounce. Smocking decorative stitching to hold the fabric in accordion like pleats they're almost um, you know pinched up straight up in the air this picture has got a lot of different um, design details we've got um, ruffles gathering uh, embroidery we've got um, some faggoting here around the neckline um, some shearing or smocking, some smocking right here. Um, the shearing is parallel rows of gathers that are made in the body of the garment. Last but not least, we want to make sure that when we're having conversations in the industry, we're using the correct terms. So when someone says, hey, um, 
let's talk about findings. Findings are support materials, so closures, threads, elastic, and labels. Um, and then specifically within the findings, closures are a huge category in itself, so is thread, elastic, and labels. But um, the main closures that you want to be familiar with are zippers, the buttons, the buttonholes, hooks and eyes, snap, snap tapes, Velcro. And then trim, when we're talking about trim, it's basically everything that we just went over, the cording, the lace, the embroidery. I actually don't think tucks should be in that cord category. I'm sorry about that. Um, ribbon all those other things so when you're working with a designer or another product developer be very mindful of what type of trim and findings that you use um, because it can really have an impact on the overall wearability and, and feel of the design